for those of you who I have not say hello, uh, once again, hello and welcome to this meetup. Uh, before I start, I uh, just want to say, um, please connect with uh, Stephen and Amanda and also uh, find the uh, opportunity to work with them to do a presentation. I think presentation is really an important part of the uh, in our professional career, not only just the work presentation, but uh, learning how to present and uh, sharing and uh, your idea about your philosophy, your way of doing work with a bigger uh, audience is a skill set that you you really want to master uh, as well as the, it would be tremendous help for your career. I know that personally uh, because I have interviewed more than 100 business leaders around the world. That is one of the common, common threads uh, that I have seen from many, many of these people. Now, Without further ado, I'm going to start my presentation. So let me bring up my PowerPoint and also share the screen. <clears throat> okay, I trust that you all can uh, see the screen. So once again, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Jason Ten, and I embed data science directly into the business operation. Now, today I'm going to show you how to integrate AI into daily business operation for an insurer with a competitor pricing engine. Now, most importantly, why do we need to shift from a standalone analytic into embedded analytic for optimizing customer experience? and revenue. Now, I'm going to share with you with a story. So this is uh, coming from my friend, Simon. He is a chief data analytic officer for an insurance company. He runs a data science center of excellence to provide advice and development to various business units within his organization. However, like many of us, he told me that he's constantly frustrated with all the analytic works that created by his team because they just never make it beyond the dashboard or the grossy PowerPoint. Don't we all love that? Now, naturally, I asked him why. So that is what he explained to me. Like many and, and any other analytic teams do fully realize the value proposed by all of these analytic models that we develop. Simon, he needs to work with the IT department to change their enterprise IT system. Now, alternatively, he needs to rely on the frontline staff to follow his manual instruction to the team. Now, sadly, it either takes forever to implement the changes or it just never get implemented at all. So how many of you in the audience can relate to this problem? I can't quite see the uh, uh, the hands uh, over here because of I am sharing the full screen of the presentation. But uh, I suspect from my experience, I think that is probably a few people who can relate to this. Why? Because we know how hard and how difficult it is to applying the data-driven philosophy with the enterprise system can be. But that's okay. I'm going to share with you today how to build an analytic, an independent analytic platform that will complement your enterprise system. And most importantly, how you will have more control over the analytic platform to drive the business impact. So here is what I'm going to show you today. Number one, how to incorporate competitor data into the analytic model and optimize revenue how to embed AI directly into business operation. And finally, how you can build an independent analytic platform, take control and use it to complement the enterprise system. By the end of this presentation, I hope you can walk away with ideas and aspiration that you need to achieve all of these points. 
Now, let's go back to my friend Simon and his company to illustrate what I will share with you today. The insurance company that Simon works for is a property and casualty insurance company called Insurizer. Well, it is a same model that you see a lot in Australia. It's a direct-to-consumer model, and it operates in a very competitive market. Primarily, they sell and provide the insurance cover for home and motor vehicle. They compete with both local and overseas players. So at Insurizon, Simon and his team are responsible for the customer pricing on the insurance product. As Simon explained that he is often frustrated by his competitor because their pricing strategy greatly impacts Simon's own revenue at Insurizon. Sometimes if they undercharge on their policy in comparison to their competitor, it basically means they are just giving the money away. Other times, they overcharge on their policy in comparison to their competitor, it makes them uncompetitive instead. Now, Simon, and you, probably many of you know that, is that it's quite common for the customer to shop around before renewing their insurance policy. I personally do that every single year. With a few clicks, customer can easily get a quote from multiple insurers, or in other words, his competitor. Now, we understand this context and the challenges he faced. Let us try to walk through the problem in his shoes and also the customer shoe. Now first, we'll first try to get a few cut from multiple insurer. So here in Australia, Simon lived in a double-story house. It's a standard quality build, and it's a beautiful, beautiful home. So we, if we estimate the building cost at around $700,000 and the content replacement cost at $150,000, $150, and so we'll try to get a code with Insurizon, which is his own company. So at Insurizon, it will cost Simon approximately $1,900 for a home and content insurance cover. <clears throat> now, with the identical information, NIMA insurance owned by the largest general insurer in Australia would quote him $3,300 for the same insurance cover. That itself is over one and a half times more expensive than what Insurizon and Simon would have charged for exactly the same cover. Now let's look at another one. How about his biggest competitor, Suncom? It would cost him approximately $2,800. So it looks like it's still relatively high in premium. Now, finally, let's see how much Budget Direct would be coding Simon. <clears throat> now, again, using precisely the same information, Budget Direct codes him at $1,945 for the insurance cover. So, what have we learned so far? First, Simon and Insurizon are the cheapest among all the provider. On average, he charged $1,200 less than his two main competitors. And secondly, the insurance price can vary quite a lot. Now, knowing all of these, these are the questions that I asked Simon. First, can you always expect your frontline staff to check the price from the competitor website. Second, how quickly can you learn the competitor price and update your enterprise system accordingly? And finally, what if you could allow the AI to determine the final price and then adjust it automatically in the enterprise system? So those are the background that, and the challenges that Simon faced in his day-to-day -day job, i.e. how to make his uh, product more competitive or how not to be undercharged compared to his competitor. 
before we go on to the next step, any question so far about this context and background? I don't think that, that See, there's uh, any questions that I have seen from this side. Amanda? No questions so far. <coughs> Wonderful. Actually, we do have one from Varun um, on the chat section. Um, he's just asking, are we talking about dynamic pricing? Yes, so that is exactly what we will be talking about, dynamic pricing. Dynamic pricing is one of the terminology uh, that used in the industry, uh, whether that is uh, in the insurance or in the retail. A lot of you would have heard of that in the Amazon uh, in the early days. So yes, thanks, thanks Varun for, for, for that. All right, um, if there is no other question, shall we continue to the next step? Thank you. Thank you. Now, with today's technology, it's really possible for Simon and any one of you to develop an analytic platform to solve all of these problems. So this is the five-step implementation that I share with Simon on my client to do just that. And we'll go through each of them in this presentation today. Oops, sorry. Let me move my, okay. Wonderful, my clicker is working. <clears throat> now, the first step is to collect the required data. And that includes both internal and external data. So in this case study, the external data will be the insurance code from Simon's competitor. And as I told him, Simon, that we can include as many or as few competitors as he like. So as long as we ensure we have the key competitor. And to collect this external data, we need a mechanism to manage them at scale. And we, to do that, we can rely on a lot of these modern data collection platforms and also their infrastructure to scale up and down according to our need. And as we are in 2022, many companies are well aware of people scrapping data from their website. As a result, these are the main two reasons that many of people would face. The first one is the website will quickly block his IP address even when dealing with public web data. Second, they could also mislead Simon or myself by showing him different information. Now to solve this problem, what we often do is we'll use modern data collection platform for all this sort of work. Now using this sort of platform, we can rely on residential proxy network. So what that basically means is that our data collection activity will never be misled or blocked. And in addition to that, we also don't have to worry about maintaining any of the infrastructure while controlling our costs based on the uh, meter usage. Through this sort of platform, we can now easily collect thousands and thousands of codes from the competitor week in, week out. And once we have collected all of this data, can reverse engineer how other insurers charge for their insurance cover. Armed with this critical information, we can then simulate how much competitor will be charging for Simon customer. In step two, we'll start building an independent analytic platform outside of the enterprise system. Now we could build this platform in any chosen language, whatever tools that you are familiar or you have within your organization, like things like Python. And more importantly, we'll also host this sort of platform in the cloud or hybrid cloud in our pricing optimization platform. So he, these are the two of the things that you want to make sure that you have. That is very, very important. So the first one is a feature engineering. And the second one is the model allocation module. So we use the model allocation module to administer the best performing model to predict and optimize the price. And apart from that, it also have a competitor pricing engine from 
uh, uh, competitive pricing engine. So the whole idea of the model allocation, not only it helps you to administer, but it also allows you to be able to switch in and switch out the model that you want to run in the production with a control of the data. Uh, so that whole idea is so that you don't have to overly, you don't have to rely on the enterprise IT system, uh, IT team to make those change for you. Instead, you can actually change it within your own platform. And more than that, you can just change it by changing the value in the data. Now, from our experience, here are the few important uh, notes and the steps that I want to share with you. The first thing first is we don't need to have everything from day one. For a data science and an AI project to succeed, it is really best to start small, deliver to prove the value, reiterate and improve. And secondly, you want to have the analytic platform sitting outside of the enterprise system. So I want to emphasize that again, and that you want that to be sitting outside of the enterprise system where you take the full control. So really your best option is to assume the full ownership of this platform. This is so that you can make changes at the pace that suit your team. Uh, step three is what the data scientist is exciting about. It is about building, training, and validating uh, the machine learning model. Now, depending on the models, you may want to include as much data as possible. In our case, the internal data would consist of the customer insurance, the policy, the claim, and any other relevant in-house data. The external data consists of the competitor pricing information that we collected in the earlier step. Now with all of that, we can then start building all the models and to predict the best price and the retention rate for his customer. So I'm not going to go into the details about what sort of model that we are building. Um, that is probably a topic for a different day. Um, trust that a lot of you who are hands-on in those things, you know uh, whatever the, you know what to choose the model. I today I'm just going to present about how my framework and how to to build a take an approach to build a system, a build a platform to complement uh, the system. <clears throat> now, again, I would also generally advise starting simple and gradually increase the model complexity over time. <clears throat> so there's another thing. When building a data science platform, we should also always have a benchmarking and a control mechanism to safeguard the business and avoid catastrophic. Now, effectively, benchmarking also helps you to compare the various model to understand how well or poorly they are performing. It will allow you to test, compare, and pick your best performing model. Whereas for the control mechanism, it is really there to avoid disaster. So in the case of our pricing optimization platform, we'll introduce cupping and capping as our control mechanism. So this is really to avoid accidentally overcharging or undercharging the customer. So for those who are not familiar, Capping is basically the maximum premium that we would charge, whereas the capping is the minimum, pre minimum premium that we would like to set for the insurance cover. Now, consequently, we will then find an optimal premium amount between the capping and capping based on the desired position in the market. So this is where you will then work with your portfolio manager uh, to understand whether we, whether they want to go for revenue or whether they want to go for retention rate so that so you know what sort of lever that you would be pushing and pulling in order uh, to achieve the desired retention rate and the desired uh, IPR and the revenue and so that it will all then get translated to find you that uh, optimal uh, price for each of the cover. When you design it right, 
all of those things will just effectively fall through. <clears throat> now, all of those are great, but in my experience, the very last step that we are going to talk about can be a sole stopper for many of the company. Now, try to, re to relate this um, to the experience that you probably have in your daily job. Um, Simon, like uh, Initial Horizon, um, like many other company, you would have an uh, enterprise system from the prominent software vendor. They make various customization to make that whole IT ERP system work for their business. However, this enterprise IT system do not necessarily support the data-driven concept in the modern IT architecture. And as a result of that, they also cannot really adapt change to changes at speed. And equally, we know there are also many other priority there are changes that the enterprise IT team, they have to cater and the needs to solve some of those changes that they need as well. Now, because of that, all of this delay or the complexity. Um, someone has a question or no? Okay, I just hear something. <coughs> oh, sorry, uh, all this complexity. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Now we do have questions, uh, but you can finish this one first. Uh, and I believe we yeah. have polls to run as well. Okay, sure. So I'll finish this one and, yeah. we'll and then we can do that. Question. Okay, awesome. <coughs> So really, I think it's the delay or the complexity of updating the enterprise system is, is causing all of these model to never re fully realize their full potential. So to make this work, we need to shift our mindset from updating the enterprise system and its processes. Repeat, we need to change our mindset from updating the system and its processes, but to only updating the database in the enterprise system. Now, a piece of advice, you want to engage your CTO and his enterprise team as early as possible. And this is also the time where you work with the enterprise ID team to design the SLA, the database update mechanism, but you only have to do it at the initial stage. And once that is signed off, we can then start formatting and updating the database in the enterprise system with all our analytic results. Now, with all of that said, the key here is to have as little human intervention as possible. We want to minimize the human error, the cost, the resources, from the manual update on the enterprise system. So like they say, speed is really the key to, to win, right? So we want to make sure we have that capacity and to be able to increase the speed of delivering and also optimizing the result from all the automation. And more than that, Simon and his team and yourself can also fine tune the machine learning model without any interference from the enterprise IT team. And most, most importantly though, I firmly believe that it is essential step to segregate the responsibility where the IT enterprise and the data science can stay truly independent one of another to perform their best work. Now, while we are on this, let's take a quick poll to understand how much uh, does everyone rely on the IT enterprise team. While well, I will also answer the question that we have from the uh, audience. I'm just going to switch over. <clears throat> question. Okay, this is. Da -da 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 -da. <clears throat> So in this example, is this the competitive price uh, specific to an address or generalized to postcode? No, this would be uh, specific to an address and this would be also specific to uh, a customer. So what I basically mean is like, if assuming you are in the insurance business, so say for example, use myself, right? So I have a 
uh, home insurance with Insurizon. Insurizon would know exactly all the factor uh, to to price my risk or to price my home insurance cover. They would use exactly all of those uh, factor to simulate to understand exactly how much the competitor would be charging. And that is done through collecting thousands and thousands of code to monitor uh, how the competitor are charging for each of those rating factors. So it's entirely possible to simulate, to know exactly how much they charge. Sometimes it could be uh, off a little bit, but you at least you get the idea of the approximate of how the competitor will be charging but it is to a specific to an address and the customer rather than a, a postcode uh, once you do the simulation. I hope that answers your question, Darren. If not, please uh, uh, feel free to, to follow up with that. Uh, the next question from Asmo. Why can the modern data platform collect competitor time, but the old way cannot as it get blocked? What is the difference? Okay, so one of the key way that the uh, the website or the big enterprise they understand how to block is they look there are a number of ways to to look at it so the first thing first is they look at the IP address <clears throat> if your IP address coming from a commercial entity so let's say for example I am right now in the office right so whatever things that I do it actually come out from a commercial IP address. So all of those IP address, uh, or the people who do this sort of thing, they know exactly how to look at the IP address and how to uh, check whether the IP address is coming out from the commercial property or a residential property. So the very first thing, the modern data platform, and there are many other ways to get around that. So the very first thing that the modern data platform, what they do is they actually have almost millions and millions of the residential IP address. So which means if you use some of these data platform to go out and do uh, data scrapping, what it does is it will use whatever all of these, the residential IP address to get around the system to show that, hey, this is not from the commercial IP. So that is one, the first thing. The second thing also is in the old days, <coughs> um, let's say, for example, if you have a programmer building some of these uh, uh, programming to, to scrap the data, if they are not building enough intelligence, a lot of time, website, they can look at the behavior of how you are going through their website. So, for example, if you make 10 different clicks, and speed through the entire process of getting a code from the very first page to all the way in just 10 seconds, then using that sort of, uh, that, that's what they call biometric behavior. And, and using that sort of biometric behavior, they can then determine whether it's a human or is a machine that is actually collecting and uh, getting a code on the website. That is a whole different topic itself in terms of the cybersecurity and also some of those um, analytic uh, platform out there where they will, they will actually look at some of these biometric uh, to understand, to do analytics. So that is a, another thing. Uh, so I hope that answer your question in terms of why modern data platform can collect the competitor data. Uh, primary, I'll just summarize that is the IP address and also the my biometric of the way of serving the web. Next question from Tracy, how do you optimize revenue in your dynamic pricing model? So I think to some extent, <clears throat> this is where part of it will be covered in the slide that I will have in this particular example that we will be showing. But very, very often though, is there are two things as there, there are two things. This is where you work with your portfolio team and your portfolio manager, where you want to check in with them because portfolio manager is the one who is responsible for the retention rate and also the revenue and the profit, right? 
often they have different goals. In the case where they are prioritizing the revenue and profit over the retention rate, what that equally basically mean is that they will often sacrifice the retention rate. So what that means is like they are happy to push up the price a little bit in the expectation that the retention rate uh, could be lower. So that is one way to optimize the revenue. Um, that is in comparison to the competitor price. But again, I want I want to highlight, I want to, to, to reiterate and emphasize that competitor price is only just one of the rating factor. But it's also a very important rating factor because we all are consumer. When is the time where you know that it's a similar product and you would be more than happy to pay uh, 25%, even though when you know someone else is selling 25% lower, right? So pricing is a very, very sensitive factor. A lot of consumers that will be paying attention, especially I think over the next couple of years, it will be even more sensitive because of the inflation, but also because the insurance premium is getting really out of hand. Um, but again, um, the other part that optimizing the premium this is where the pricing actually would also come in into the picture where they need to make sure that uh, from their claim experience, from the uh, claim data that they are paying out, how much they should be equally be charging to make sure they are covering the cost, covering the payout, uh, the future payout, and uh, also the expectation of the, uh, the revenue. So there are multiple factors. I hope that answer your question, Tracy. <clears throat> Darren, I'm interested to chat later about how you capture the data since most insurer only code to a prospect email. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I'm, I'm interested to chat later how you, not exactly unsure what do you mean. So that is possible, number one, in this particular example that we are talking about, we actually only focus on the renewal customer, the renewal portfolio. Uh, so what that means is that, for example, in the case of the Insurizon, I am already uh, a customer of um, Insurizon. So Insurizon would know all my details. So what they subsequently do is, as they are repricing for my renewal, uh, policy, they would also simulate my uh, my policy to know what their competitor is charging and then uh, build all of those things into the analytic model to optimize the price and optimize the retention rate. In terms of the new business, <coughs> it is also possible <coughs> in different way, but uh, we will probably talk a little bit more about that. Um, any other question? Uh, should I check? Sorry, Amanda or Steve, should I check the chat section or all the questions uh, would be just in this section, in this area? Uh, so I don't think that we have um, any more questions on the chat section. And uh, I just wanted to let you know, Jason, that uh, Stephen had to drop off so he can read Lewis, mm -hmm. his son, a bedtime story. <laughs> But I do have Mark Bernard joining, uh, who joined us. So uh, Mark is with us. And I think oh, you can hi, go Mark. ahead and continue with uh, your slides. <coughs> Absolutely. Hey, Mark, thanks for joining and uh, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> all right. So continuing to where we are, and I hope some of these answer the question you have, uh, Tracy. So now, by updating the database in the enterprise system with the data from our pricing optimization, this is what will happen. Number one, the insurance cover will now have the best price as per our model, which is $2,200. The frontline staff will not have to manually look up the competitor website to check if the offer price is competitive or not. In fact, they don't even have to know anything about this at all because all is done in the background. And most, most importantly, I often joke with Simon, he has successfully embedded analytic result from our pricing optimization directly into the business operation. 
Now, let's look at the result from the Simon a single one example. After the optimization, Insurizon would charge extra $275 or 12.5% more than before while remaining competitive. And bear in mind, this is only for one single custom, customer. So imagine the impact that you could have or Simon can have when he replicate this for the entire portfolio. And as for the cost perspective, how much time in FTE we could be saving and how much human error we could also avoid. And since this implementation, my friend Simon, he never has to worry about the competitor crushing his price anymore because he is constantly monitoring and always one step ahead of them. And most importantly, Simon, he told me, he never have to prepare a new PowerPoint for every new model that they create in their platform to convince the executive and the IT team to take up the suggestion. Instead, they merely deploy the model into their analytic platform. They will benchmark, they will compare with all the models that is already in place to make appropriate decision. And also, because there is a control mechanism in place, the executive team can rest assured that our pricing optimization platform will not produce unexpected results that could destroy the business. Now, I know not everyone works in the insurance industry and many of you are from different sector. So some of you are wondering if this applies to your industry and your work or not. Now, from our experience, many different company and operation can equally embed analytics into their business front line. So here are a few examples, one that is everyone is familiar and also uh, the company that Mark works for. The first one is, we are very familiar, right? Increase the basket size in the shopping cart by recommending the relevant product to customer. That is the result of embedding the analytics into your website. The second one that is quietly happening in the banking sector now is to use analytic AI and AI in reducing the churn rate with a retention engine. Now, finally, another frontier of embedded analytics is to increase the customer engagement and experience with on-time communication. Now, combining the second and the third example, you probably have noticed you're receiving a little bit more communication from your bank this day. So these are probably the reason why. <clears throat> now, we are almost at the end of the presentation. So let me briefly restate the main point that we discussed today. So you can take them and share with your colleagues. And like Simon, you can start implementing these to bulletproof your future. Now, step one, collect all the required data, internal or external data. Step two, take control and build an independent analytic platform outside of your enterprise system. Step three, constantly build, test, and compare your machine learning model. Step four, develop a benchmarking and a control mechanism. And finally, step five, streamline and update the database. Now, before I let you go, let's do another poll to see the most common challenge that people face when embedding the analytics into the business operation. Amanda, can you run the poll for me, please? Thank you. <clears throat> it's cute now. And results are actually being shown to the audience as well. <clears throat> Thank you. And while we are waiting for the results, so I want to share with you how we started with the customer and work back work to innovate. Um, this is a really a favorite uh, quote from uh, Jeff Bezos, who I'm a big fan with. And uh, I want to say it's exactly the same ideology, right? That we built all this thing for Simon and Israel precisely on this. So we started by wanting to provide probably the best price and the best experience for the customer. And then we work back work 
to collect the data and build a pricing optimization platform to complement the enterprise system. And finally, we continue to automate and optimize the engine. And I think this is where Simon and I really realize and discover is really not the pretty dashboard or the visual analytic or the PowerPoints that matter. Instead, we found the best way to optimize the customer experience and revenue is to embed analytic into the business operation and front line. We also think that innovation is really the only way to safeguard our business. And you can see uh, what is happening in the Silicon Valley already. And finally, I also want to say, developing an analytic-driven system is really easier than ever before. Like Simon, you don't need hundreds of engineers to build every element from scratch. You don't, you don't need thousands of engineers to build everything that Amazon has to build. A lot of the things that Amazon has got in today's world, there are already many other platforms are providing all of those little things. All you have to do is just plug and play, plug and play with various and technology platform from the market. So the cost of having such platform are even cheaper and more accessible than ever before. So, and another thing is obviously um, with the AWS, it's just another, it's just another tool and another platform that you can really take advantage of um, to build, deploy, and test whatever the models or the system or the AI platform that you want to use to complement your enterprise system to optimize the experience. So, my fellow data scientists. Take action and take action now. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. That's awesome. Actually, I have a question, if I may. Go for it. Um, yeah, that, that stage in the middle where you're developing and constantly iterating on the machine learning models, it's, it seems like there's two, two ways of doing that. One is the traditional way using R and Python and uh, maybe some linear regression, whatever your favorite um, sort of approach or algorithm might be. The other is the automated platforms like Data Robot, Data IQ, SageMaker, et cetera. Would you see those having a place? Which way do you see the industry going? Um, what's the, uh, what, what would you suggest? Is, is it a mix of both? What, 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 what is the optimal? I probably will say that a mix of both and each of these has its own advantages. I probably would say that if you are wanting to have the full flexibility, um, go for R, go for Python, go for whatever uh, the tools. Equally, you can use the data robot to do all of those things. But I would probably say the biggest, biggest takeaway um, that from my experience and also from many places that I have worked with, from the people that I have worked with, the biggest, biggest challenge is, it's not about, it's actually, it has, it's not really about the building the model. Every, a lot of people can build the model, but the challenges that a lot of people that they face is when they build the model, they, they try to understand a certain behavior and try to understand what is happening in certain part of the portfolio or what is the customer is thinking. Once they build all of those models and they understand that, then what they will do is they will then have to go to work with the enterprise IT team and they have to compete for the, prior, the prioritization. They have to compete with the, uh, the enterprise team to make all of those changes with them. And that is where the biggest problem is because that is where a lot of things get stuck. Either the executive never had the time to read the report or the suggestion, or they never got a chance to implement all of the changes because if you were to make changes to the core enterprise system, it will always be challenging because you have to compete for the priority. Second, Changing enterprise system, the core system, it also means that it's a risk of screwing up. That is why 
very often they will try to limit with that. The, the, the key to make this work is you want to identify what is one area that you want to really make a big impact. In our case, it is the price, the, the price and the experience. Why? Price, because it directly impacts the purchasing decision of the customer, the customer experience. Why? Because you wouldn't want to spend 30 minutes on the phone call with the call center consultant just to get a price. While well, you are spending 30 minutes at the call center to get a price, the consultant are running various things to get you a price, but also he probably have to go to uh, all those competitor website to get a code to see whatever the price that he's going to offer to you is going to competitive or not. That itself, no one would actually want to spend 30 minutes or even 60 minutes in some cases with some of the insurer just to get a premium whether and, and decide whether you want to achieve or not, uh, to proceed or not. So those are the two things that got impacted. In the case of the Amazon, really that um, there are a few things happening in that, but if we just focus on that, um, people who buy A versus the, uh, people who buy A are likely to buy B, those are the exact result as well to integrate and embed that whole analytic directly into your business operation. Newsfeed recommendation engine that we all use day to day, uh, uh, the Netflix or YouTube or Facebook, LinkedIn, exactly the same with that. It, at the end of the day, is really about building that. I suspect that the all of those two can be done, but the biggest thing is how do people understand where inside the enterprise system that they have to make the adjustment and change one and everything else will fall through. I equally suspect that I know from experience, is I think uh, some of those newer tools uh, certainly make it easier for what they call the citizen uh, data scientists to be able to play around uh, to, to build up this model. I, I hope that answer your question. It was a, a, a long way. To, to 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 get to the what I was hoping to to share. Yeah, no, that's cool. Thank you, Jason. And by the way, I do apologize for for coming for uh, appearing late in uh, the meeting. But I do have one question, Jason, and you might be able to help here in terms of next steps. <coughs> um, if someone is in a pricing team and they're interested in, like, can you run a workshop for their team? Do you actually act as a consultant and you could run an end-to-end -end strategy? What, what's like, how do we engage with you or what would the next steps be? Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for that shout out. Yeah, I can run a workshop to uh, provide the training and the advisory in terms of like how to put the things together. What are the consideration? What sort of data that we need to understand? Equally, uh, what are the platform and the tools that is available in the market that we I can help to do the assessment as well as the, the deployment to the cloud uh, platform. Uh, and uh, also the other part is collecting the data and making sure your data is clean, is good uh, and available for before we do all these fancy things. A lot of time is um, majority of the time is really understanding the strategy, um, understanding what we are trying to achieve also making sure that the data is uh, available and is clean. I think that is where uh, Mark can uh, really come into the picture to, to help with uh, the works that he is doing, that, I, that he has been doing for the last 20 years. I can equally uh, help to developing uh, the system um, and uh, the way that can be done is whether I typically I work with the internal team from the organization to build this together so that the the knowledge and the expertise would be retained by the time we finish. Thank you for that, Mark. <clears throat> yeah, fantastic. I guess we should wrap up. We're just up at the top of the hour and we did promise one hour. Can I make one last little push that um, we do have beer ops coming up. It is seriously the biggest gathering of IT professionals that is uh, covered by sponsors. Uh, Stephen Wallace does an amazing job. He's been running this for many years. Uh, networking on steroids, that's what it is. So, Amanda, if you could throw the links again to <coughs> Beer Ops Sydney and Melbourne, 
uh, into the chat. And uh, can I encourage you to sign up and join and then come up, come along and meet, meet the team, uh, meet myself, I'll be there. And it's just, we've, we've had, you know, many, many, many people sign up already. So it's going to be an awesome night. So I think Amanda has just popped those links in the chat. So if you're in Sydney or if you're in Melbourne, or if you want to fly into Sydney or Melbourne, then uh, come and join us on those nights. And um, thank you, everyone. And I shall thank you, Jason, especially for such an awesome presentation. Very, very informative and very helpful. And I'll hand over to our host, Amanda, to <laughs> shut us down, I guess. Is thank you so today? much for that, uh, for having me, Mark, uh, for being a wonderful host, and Amanda for being a wonderful host. I uh, appreciate that. The only question I have for you, Mark, is Beer Up is in Sydney and Melbourne. What is happening with Brisbane? <laughs> I know, brother. I know. We will. I'll have. I'll have a word okay. with Stephen, and I'll uh, let him sure know. You have a word with the AWS, so they can throw in a couple of bucks to have one in Brisbane.